Good evening, everyone. It is with immense pleasure that I, Mehak Salia, welcome you all to the prestigious guest lecture series organized by Technovanza VJTI. VJTI was established in the year 1887 and is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and educational progress. Furthermore, it has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of the society. Taking technology to society has always been the aim of Technomancer. An ardent desire to enlighten young minds and inoculate impeccable qualities within them has been the very objective of guest lecture series since its inception. Over the years, we have had pioneers of diverse fields, some of them being Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Gaur Gopal Das, and Mr. Ratan Tata. In fact, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, was gracious enough to send us a special message encouraging us to balance external technological and material progress with the sense of responsibility that only comes through inner development. All of them have added immense value to the lives of several young minds. A new vision and scale of values are the necessary measures required for safeguarding the world. It goes without saying, any change demands a foremost change in our views, attitudes, and intentions. Today is a day when we add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of remarkable individuals. I would like to introduce you all to a remarkable personality, His Holiness Radhana Swamiji. His Holiness Radhanath Swamiji is a New York Times best-selling author, philanthropist, and speaker. His work of feeding 300,000 children per day in India and establishing several philanthropic projects has led him to meetings with former US President Barack Obama, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, and UK Prime Ministers Tony Blair and David Cameron. His Holiness is famously known for guiding influencers, world leaders, CEOs, and corporations around the world, and ability to inspire change and magic within large communities all over the world. His Holiness speaking portfolio includes Google, uh, headquarters of Google, Apple, HSBC, Intel, Facebook, and NASDAQ, Princeton University, MIT University, Oxford, Cambridge, Houses of Parliament, Cherer, Huffington Post, to name a few. He is the founder of Govardhan Eco Village, which is a 100-acre sustainability community just outside of Mumbai. This eco village is a model which is equipped to combat some of the world's largest issues, including climate change, poverty, and access to healthcare. Swamiji has also founded a hospital, an orphanage, a school, and several other philanthropic projects. Swamiji, this small introduction wouldn't do enough justice to you. You have blended the eloquent qualities of love and compassion with absolute sublimity, which can never be unseen. We are truly honored by your presence today, Swamiji. We will have a question and answer session after the lecture. So please leave your questions in the live chat below. So without any further ado, Let's be a part of a conversation of our shared future under the guidance of clearly the very best. Over to you, Swamiji. Om Mokyan Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Asjatyate Shatarine 
Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Sri Adwaita Gadadhar Shiva Siddhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> I am sincerely grateful and honored and very happy to be with all of you today. This um, very great established educational institution of VJTI um, has given guidance, inspiration, and the tools of knowledge to countless people to contribute to the well being of humanity and society. And I'm, I'm so very much um, proud of all of you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate. At this particular time during the coronavirus, COVID-19, there's a lot of anxiety there's growing depression, there's fears. In the economic situation, there has been quite historical challenges for our generation. And how, how are we to actually grow through these conditions? This is the subject that I was asked to speak on. <clears throat> Human nature is that when there is crisis, when there is provoking challenges that are apparently beyond our control, it's a time where we can actually become great. My beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada, he wrote that true greatness is to be tested in provoking situations. And we see the great people of the world, how crisis helped to make them great and give a legacy that even generations after them, people are inspired and take direction from. Um, in fact, I believe that this college, this university is named after the, the wife of Chhatrapati Shivaji. Um, Shivaji did not live in a very peaceful, congenial time. It was a time of urgency. It was a time of great need. And it was that urgency that actually um, awakened within him courage, creativity, and incredible efforts for, for, for the society around him and the people. And it was how he stood in that provoking crisis that made him great and that magnified his greatness for us today. Um, technology, science are sacred tools when they are in the hands of people with values. Um, technology itself and science has developed so much in times of crisis. I'm just now remembering when I was a young boy growing up in America. In the 1950s, there was what we called the Cold War between 
the Soviet Union and the United States. And there was a lot of fear in America because um, both Russia, the Soviet Union, and America had nuclear bombs. And there was this arms race, and it seemed almost imminent that there could be a world war at any moment. It was at that time when, Ru when America was really feeling they were a superior power that Russia put the first satellite into outer space. It was named Sputnik. That Sputnik created a wave of fear in America. It was a testimony that an arch enemy was actually superior to us in science and technology. At that time, the US government put huge resources and finances into the universities and colleges to develop science and technology and provided scholarships for students who wanted to dedicate their lives to that. It was an urgent crisis that appeared that our, the safety of our nation depended on it. And so much in the field of science and technology expanded due to that crisis. Um, the greatness of Gandhi is very much how he responded to the crisis that he faced in his life, as was Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King. So that potential of greatness is actually within all of us, where we are given a choice to make the decision <laughs> to face difficult conditions, seeking being instruments of a positive solution. If we are not looking for light in darkness, we will remain in the darkness. But oftentimes it's at dark times that we understand the necessity to look for that light. In our physical body, the idea of pain is important. When we have a particular pain in our body, then we acknowledge there may be something wrong. And then we're inspired to actually solve that problem. It may be taking medicine, it may be getting therapy. We're addressing a, a need when there's pain. And similarly with the mind, anxiety, loneliness, um, frustration, these are symptoms of need in our life. That a foundation is required within ourselves to actually remain stable, remain peaceful, maintain our character, our integrity, and our values, even in trying times. Yes, um, I remember many, many years ago when I was traveling in India, um, I met a meditation teacher who later, later became very, very famous. And he told about how he was in a state of depression, economic, financial, great loss. Um, uh, the country he was living, the government was, was, was usurping people's private property. And in that state, he found a teacher and learned to meditate. 
and got so much peace and so much enlightenment, he became one of the greatest meditation teachers in the world. Bhagavad Gita was not spoken in a peaceful environment. It was a battlefield. It was really an urgent crisis. The Kurus, the Pandavas, two opposing armies with massive um, military were about to have a war. And Arjuna, he was in such a confused state. He really didn't know which way to turn. The Bhagavad Gita first chapter describes the nature of his confusion, his anxiety. But then he turned. He turned to Krishna. He turned to the one God of all living beings who has, who has many names, who has appeared in many forms, in many places throughout history. And at that time, there was a hunger in his heart. He was not just curious for a solution. He was not just interested in a direction in life. There was a crisis. There was a need. And he heard this message. And that knowledge became a foundation that he could build his life upon. So these times that we're facing um, can transform our lives in a very positive way. Because to the extent each and every one of your lives are transformed in a positive way, to that very same degree, you will have the power to transform society and the world in a positive way. And those of you who are studying in this, this, this wonderful educational institution where the, the tools of science, technology, engineering are being taught to you, you could have a great effect on the world how science and how technology is affecting the way people live. It's, it's quite inconceivable and unbelievable. You know, in, in my father's life, when he was a child, the, the entertainment of the family would be to sit in front of a radio and hear somebody speaking or singing, that was it. You had to be an extremely wealthy person to have a telephone that you had to crank and crank and crank to get an operator to connect you with someone. Now, we have these satellite TVs with hundreds of stations. We have these smartphones that act as computers we can be we 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 have this zoom technology uh, that we're sharing today where hundreds and hundreds of people are gathered together from all over the world in real time speaking we have airplanes we have automobiles, we have rocket ships. It, it's incredible how much science and technology is very much um, leading, leading human society and how important it is that these gifts are in the hands of people who have compassion who are really not f expressing their frustration or their greed or their arrogance through their creative intelligence, but rather expressing compassion, goodness, kindness, and trying to make a real positive difference 
that will bring people happiness. Um, my teacher, he once said that the whole Vedic civilization, it has one purpose. Sarve Sukhano Bhavantu. Let all beings be happy. In giving people happiness, our hearts find happiness. And to the degree our hearts find happiness, we can give people more happiness. Whatever our particular occupation may be, we may be engineers, we may be doctors, we may be lawyers, we may be politicians, we may be professors, students, farmers, mothers, fathers, business, whatever it may be, the greatness of our life is in how we're actually making a positive difference within the world around us. People may envy you for what you have, but no one will love you for what you have. People love you for who you are and the values that you represent. And the heart seeks love. Things, things like fame and wealth and property and power, these things can give some degree of satisfaction to the physical senses and to the mind but they cannot touch the heart. The heart only wants two things, to love and to be loved. And from a spiritual perspective, the origin of that love is the eternal soul's natural love for the Supreme or for God. When you water the root of the tree, naturally that water extends to every leaf and branch and twig and flower of the tree. And similarly, spirituality is not a sectarian idea. It's not something to, to, to just feed our arrogance or respond to our insecurities. Spirituality is something very positive. It's meant to help us to actually tune in to the innate love that is within our souls, our hearts. And when that love for God is awakened, it naturally extends to all living beings. On that battlefield of Kurukshetra, Krishna gave about 700 verses to Arjuna, and one of them has always really struck my mind. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni chaiva swapakeja pandita samadarshana. Real knowledge, true enlightened wisdom is not just about how much data we have stored in our brain. It's not in how many um, verses we memorize or how many sciences and technologies we have mastered. Real knowledge is the capacity to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is black or white or red or yellow or brown, whether one is male or female from the East or the West, whether one is a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jain or a Sikh or a Parsi or a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or a Baha'i or an agnostic or an atheist. The key to even extends it to whether one's a human or a dog or a cat or an elephant or a cow. Life is sacred. 
when we appreciate this truth that life is sacred, life is an extension of the divine, when we actually come in tune with the nature of our own spiritual consciousness, God consciousness, or we call Krishna consciousness, then we're tuned into the divinity, the sacredness of all life. And we deal with situations according to what's required, but it's not with envy, it's not with hate, it's with real compassion. That's the greatest need in the world. That's the greatest need to be developed within the hearts and the minds of people of all walks of life, including scientists and engineers and technologists. Because then with the great tools that we have, we could really do something wonderful and that will give meaning and fulfillment to our hearts. I remember years ago, I was sitting on the banks of the river Ganges, a Ganga, and I happened to see a hawk a very large bird soaring in the sky. He was looking down. It was the summertime, and I was all alone in the banks of, this, of the Ganga. And I was thinking, is that hawk looking at me? His glistening yellow eyes just staring down as he was hovering lower and lower and lower. Suddenly, <laughs> He dove into the river. He went underwater for a moment, and I saw a skirmish. And then he emerged. This hawk came out with a fish in his claws. And the fish was flapping desperately. And I was only a few meters away so I could see the fish's eyes. He looked so completely bewildered and disoriented, flapping desperately and hopelessly for survival as the hawk carried him further and further, higher and higher until he went into a forest and disappeared. Now, what is this story telling us? It's something we may see every day, but actually everyday things can give us most necessary enlightening lessons of life if we're seeking those lessons. If we seek truth, even the most common everyday experiences will reveal truth to us. If we seek the fulfillment of greed, then those things will be revealed to us. So like that fish, you know, we are, we may be swimming around in the, in, in the river of life um, with our friends, with our families. We may be looking for food, trying to earn a living, trying to get more knowledge, all of these things we're doing, just going through our lives. But at any moment, the hawk, the hawk of a provoking situation, the hawk of a crisis, we may say the hawk of destiny, may come upon us and just rip us out of that comfort zone. Complacency is a great impediment to progress on every level. Necessity is a great inspiration for progress on every level. So when that hawk took the fish out, the fish was not expecting it. Individually, 
collectively as a society and today the whole world. This COVID-19 is like the hawk. It's taken individuals and it's taken society worldwide out of a comfort zone, out of a state of complacency. In that situation, it's important to recognize that if that fish was swimming deeper in the river of life, the hawk could not have touched him. And similarly, as long as our values, our aspirations are built upon superficial, very external, ever-changing goals, as long as we're endlessly distracted by all little things, then we're very vulnerable to deep anxiety, individually and collectively. We can easily be destabilized. But when we see this happening to ourselves and we see this happening to the world, it's an indication that we need to go deeper, to find deeper purpose, deeper meaning, deeper values to our very life. What is the legacy we want to give to the world? Is it just what we've accomplished? Or will it be how we have actually helped others to be uplifted. That's the greatest accomplishment. Another analogy of another bird is the crane. The crane is a bird that stands on one leg in a stream of water and is looking down into the current. So many little fish by the dozens, by the hundreds are swimming by and the crane is just watching patiently. When a big fish comes, the crane feasts. He's just waiting for the big fish. Now I'm a vegetarian and I don't eat fish, but, but cranes do. <laughs> That is the God-given nature of a crane. And we could learn from this principle that if we're focusing our attention too much on all the little frivolous things that are happening in this world, we're constantly distracted. We're attracted. We're repulsed by all these small things. But if we're actually looking in life for what's really important, then all the little distractions, we deal with them effectively, but we're not disturbed by them. We're not overly disturbed. And those distractions do not dictate who we are and why we're living. Meditation, prayer, puja, in my tradition, chanting beautiful mantras or God's names. These are ways of actually finding a deep happiness, a deep meaning, a deep reality within ourselves. And if we invest some time every day for this purpose, and we invest some time to be with people who actually give us this type of spiritual inspiration and, and faith, 
than that deep experience. We express that love, that compassion, that joy in what we're doing. And then we could actually live with a meaningful integrity in our life, in whatever role we may have. How important that is. Perhaps that's the greatest need in the world today for people in all walks of life to show that type of compassion and to live by it and to live, leave that legacy of compassion. The foundation of a house is so important. If you build a house, however beautiful it may be, it may be a little hut made out of straw and simple bamboo, or maybe a magnificent palace. Of, of marble and onyx with beautiful furniture. It may be a, a multi-level skyscraper. But most important is the integrity of the foundation. Because if you build whatever structure it is on, sh on sand, it will look beautiful. It will feel beautiful and comfortable, but when a storm comes, it will collapse. But if it's built on a strong foundation, whether it's a sunny, clear day, or whether it's a massive storm, it will stand. So our peace of mind, our happiness, our propensity to love and be loved, and our contribution to society and the world through our character, our values, and our integrity need to be built on a solid foundation. And that's really the purpose of spirituality, to give that foundation. The body and the mind are very vulnerable. At any moment, this physical body could die. And we know for sure in due course, we will grow old. We're subject to disease and death will come. Where is the real meaning in life to this? This is where every great spiritual teacher throughout history have enlightened us that we are the immortal eternal state of consciousness that's observing reality through this body and mind. We're seeing through our eyes and tasting through our tongue and hearing through our ears and loving through our hearts. We are the witness, the atma, the jiva, the spirit. And the nature of that spirit is a part of God. The nature of that spirit is to be an instrument of love. And while we're here, we could do wonderful things to enlighten people and bring happiness physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That is our opportunity. And it is in situations like we're facing today that we can focus our attention on actually taking very seriously that this is a need for myself, for my family, and for the world. At times of problems, when we see positive opportunities for change, which begins with change of myself, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. We hear it. We hear the Gita. 
We hear whatever religious scripture you may follow, or we hear from, uh, from people of wisdom. But how do we really take it serious and apply it to our life? There needs to be a hunger from necessity. And although there's so much sadness and so much crying for so much suffering on many levels, economically, financially, the health of people, the emotions of people, in that suffering, we can introspect. <laughs> what really is that deep, meaningful purpose of life? Are we just victimized by endless distractions? Are superficial things so much um, determining our happiness and distress? Or do we want to find the depths of what's really meaningful in life and experience and share the happiness of that? And in order to do that, to invest in building a strong, wonderful foundation in our life. And then all of our sciences and technologies, individually and collectively, we can, we can do such good. We could enlighten the world. Thank you very much. Swamiji, so now we have a couple of questions for you. So uh, the first question is, what is the difference between karma and bhakti? And uh, people are asking, what is more important, karma or bhakti? What should we do? <laughs> there are various ways to define either of those. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, it's common to understand karma as action. The law of karma means the law of action and reaction. Like there's the law of gravity, what goes up must come down. That's yeah. an action. So, you know, karma is action in that sense to perform our duty. And bhakti is the um, action that is done with devotion to God and with true compassion for other living beings. True. Yes. I'm also a giant, so I do know. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So the, we have a second question. So as I said in my introduction, that you have inspired numerous people around the world. But we want to know who is your inspiration and what is the most profound lesson that they have imparted to you? <laughs> <laughs> there might be um, many, but we want like the most profound. Well, that hawk, it was an inspiration for me. Okay. <laughs> and that little fish was an inspiration. Okay. So we can, we, can find, we can find God speaking to us in so many ways. Yes. But the greatest inspiration in my life um, was the voice of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. I remember when I was just about 20 years old, I was for some time living in Kurukshetra, sitting under the banyan okay. tree in which it was spoken and reading it. And when I met my beloved teacher, Srila Prabhupada, his, his wisdom and knowledge and his representing something that I, that I understood was so genuine in the tradition and was so universal. And the compassion of his example I, I just wanted to assist. I just wanted to follow. And yes. for the last 50 years, that's what I've been doing. Yes, truly. <laughs> so uh, and you've been doing it really well. So you've inspired a lot of people all around the world, truly. 
Then I, I'm honored by your kind words, and please pray for me that I can try to live up to your expectations. Absolutely. <laughs> so we have one more question. So in such difficult times, how do we find hope? And we are asking this as youngsters, as students. How do we find hope in such tough times? You're not able to go to college. <laughs> it's it's really sad situation. Um, in the Bible, there's a beautiful quotation: "Seek, and you will find." So we have to look for hope. Yes, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> if, if we sincerely look for hope then we will find hope. Yes. <laughs> um, we can't give up. That's true. Um, as I was trying to explain in my talk, oftentimes we're looking for hope in very fallible situations, yes. in fa fallible roles, in ever-changing um, circumstances, in, in, in very superficial relationships with people. Um, we're looking for hope in those things. Yes. And at times of crisis, um, we're not finding hope there anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, yeah. in, our, in our everyday life, you know, in our complacency, we seem to be finding hope in those things. But now it seems to all be shattered and it's a it's a disoriented time, which is healthy in the sense that it gives us an opportunity to seek hope where there's actually deep, meaningful hope. Yes, yes. And that's really. in and and that's in our relationship with the Supreme, and that's in our spiritual identity, and that's seva, the idea of serving with compassion is the greatest thing we could do for the world in whatever our particular role may be. And we find hope in that loving service. We find hope in the shelter of, of, of divine grace, of God's grace. Yes. And then we want to share that hope with others. Yes, truly. Such an so, insightful thought. Yes. So if we're, if we're looking for that for that deep, meaningful hope, we will find it. But we can't give up because just like getting a degree in the college, it's not just something you go for one day and you get it. Yeah. You have to persevere. And similarly, we have to persevere in our pursuit of truth. We have to per persevere in our pursuit of a life of compassion and meaning. Yes. True, Lisa. Sometimes hope is all we have for a better tomorrow. And so we have to seek for it. Yes. Then uh, and fifth question we have is, how do you inculcate spirituality into modern education? Uh, like in our value education textbooks, how do we inculcate spirituality? Because right now it's just going, reading the textbook, writing the paper, that's it. We're not inculcating anything in ourselves. Um, so how do school curriculums inculcate spirituality? difficult situations can shake us up to actually reevaluate what's already there. Yeah. <laughs> right now we're writing the paper and we're <laughs> memorizing things. But, um, you know, Arjuna in, in the Gita, as I was explaining, he already knew all these things. <laughs> but you can know and not know. Yes. <laughs> you could know mentally, but really knowledge is meant to transform us. Knowledge is meant to enlighten us. Knowledge is meant to awaken us. And um, when we really feel a necessity, a hunger for that knowledge, then it actually has that, per it, it has that effect. And it's important to, to seek out people who inspire us in this way. Yes, surely. Yes. <laughs> and uh, one more question is, this is a, a question with someone's asking you if uh, to you know, be close to Krishna, is it necessary to join ISKCON? Or can we, uh, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or can we not be a part of ISKCON and still be close to Krishna? 
Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam, that Hridesh, Sarvasya Chaham Hridishani Vishto, he's within, God is within everyone's heart. Yes. We are, there's nothing closer to us than God, whoever we are. And whether it's ISKCON or any religion, that is, Sanatan Dharma is, in, is a universal principle, which ISKCON and other spiritual groups, you know, we're, we're striving to actually represent that concept of Sanatan Dharma, which is universal, that the Supreme Being or God, who has many names, is is within our hearts yes. as, and is within the heart of everyone. And yoga means to live in harmony with that knowledge where one's body, one's mind are in harmony with one's heart and with, with one's soul, where we live in harmony with God, with, with other living beings and with nature. That harmony is the purpose of dharma. And that harmony ultimately has its essence in the awakening of love. And that is not the monopoly of any particular spiritual yeah. path. It's not the monop monopoly of any religion. It is at the very essence of all true religions and spiritual paths. Yes, correct. <laughs> Truly. Then uh, one more. Uh, we have a question from one of the pubs. He's uh, asking, is there any other method to achieve higher level of consciousness other than meditation? Um, in the Vedic literatures and in other literatures as well, the, the chanting of these spiritual sound vibrations or mantras or names of God are considered very powerful and effective in awakening that innate okay. love and happiness, the ananda within us. Um, you know, some approach it by meditation, by prayer, yeah. by seva, by actually mm. living with self, living and engaging our, our natures in selfless service, if, you know, for the well-being of others. Um, chanting God's names, chanting these beautiful mantras tunes us in very, very directly to that inner treasure of consciousness within us by which we could actually express that love, which is a universal principle of the soul through whatever we do and whatever we speak, whoever we're with. Yes. <laughs> So we'll be taking one last question, Swamiji. Uh, so this is a quote which you have said a lot of times. The question we have to ask is not whether something is difficult or not, but rather whether it is right or not. If something is right, we should be willing to do anything and give everything for that purpose. You have said that, Swamiji. So our question to you is, uh, how do you define the clarity of purpose in your life? Like, how do you recommend today's youth on building a true passion and also developing a true like, purpose in life <laughs> for the students, for the young generation? Yes. Um, being young is a great gift and treasure. <laughs> yes. And oftentimes we don't really appreciate the tremendous opportunity we have when we're young until we're old. <laughs> Definitely. Sir. My parents. Don't forget them. That's, that's too much the nature of life. You know, now I'm 70 years old. So when I think of when I was young, Oh, what I could have done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but youth is a time to, it, it's, it's the most opportune time to really develop that inner spiritual foundation of character and values and apply that to our studies and to our aspirations for the future. It is really important. Just, yes. like, just like when we're young, we have the greatest opportunity 
to learn through colleges and universities. At simultaneously, that same youth gives us the opportunity, the best opportunity to develop that integrity of consciousness. Komara acharit pragyo dharman bhagavataniha. Our little Prahlad, he was five years old and he told his, his classmates, this is the most important time to understand what is Bhagavad Dharma. Yes. This is the most important time to understand who I am and what the purpose of life I really want to achieve. This is the time to, to develop that foundation. And then through our, through our education, through our careers, through our families, through our influence, we could build something beautiful on a foundation of truth, enlightenment, and compassion, and love. And we need to associate with people who, who want that yes. as much as possible. And, and we need a spiritual practice wherein we can actually directly tune into that. And then throughout the day, it's just like we eat and we sleep and we get strength by doing that. If we just try to do our studies or work and we think, well, I don't have time to eat and sleep, then we really won't have much quality. So similarly, our values, our character, our very souls, our hearts need nourishment. <laughs> yes, <laughs> need do. nourishment and rest. And satsang or being with spiritually minded people and a spiritual practice, sadhana, is like giving nourishment and strength to our inner qualities. And then we could live actively, not yes. just to accomplish, but to accomplish even more with character, with values, and hopefully with true compassion. Yes, Swamiji. So with this question, we end the question and answer session, Swamiji. And so at a time when, you know, faith seems to be in a collision with so many other questions that come up as a matter of individual liberty, I think this will make for a very interesting and important conversation for our times. Thank you, Swamiji, for your truly exhilarating words. We will surely do our best to inculcate these values in our everyday lives as students, as the new generation. Thank you so much for sharing your invaluable knowledge with us, Swamiji. Hare Krishna. I am very grateful to, to you and to everyone who is assembled today. And I pray with all my heart that strength and health and blessings be upon all of you. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. I'm, I'm truly blessed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the upcoming GLS will be held on the 16th of October, 5 p.m. The speaker for which is Mr. Suresh Prabhu, former cabinet minister of railways and India's Sherpa to the G7 and G20. Stay tuned. I am Mehak Salia signing off. Until next time, this is Technovanza VJTI.